Well, good morning again. You've seen me a few times already this morning. I always have to have my water with me. I, I apologize. Some of you have commented that I, I, that I drink too much during the sermon, but I'm doing better about that, right? I, I, yeah, see. Uh, now, something that comes to mind is a psalm that says, If the Lord does not build the house, in vain does the builder build. If the Lord does not watch over the city, in vain does the watchman keep vigil. And when I hear that, I think about the experience of preaching. And the same would be true for the experience of listening to a sermon, right? That if the Lord does not give his word, in vain does the preacher preach, right? So it's an honor and a privilege, as always, to come before you with God's word. So I always hope that the message is biblical, the message is rooted in scripture, rooted in the gospel. Today's gospel reading, uh, which was read for us already, provides us with the opportunity for a kind of spiritual self-assessment. And I know that these types of things are popular because if, you, if you're online, if you're on Facebook, you see there's always these kinds of different surveys of sort of personality tests, right? Like what, what sort of animal are you or what country would you best live in or which era should you have been born? You guys know what I'm talking about, right? We see things like that because we like to sort of give answers and then they can tell us something about ourselves, right? We like stuff like that. Well, that's kind of what Jesus is doing here in the form of this parable. The form of a parable, the story of a sower who, gives, who goes out to sow. And the question that it asks us is, what kind of Christian are you? This is our spiritual self-assessment. So as Jesus tells this story, this parable of the sower, the seed, Jesus says in Luke chapter 8, the seed is the word of God. Now, we might immediately think that that refers to the Bible. But what I always have to remind people is that in the Bible, the Word of God is used primarily to refer to Jesus, right? The Bible is the Word of God only in a secondary sense. The Bible is the Word of God only insofar as it points us to Jesus. Jesus is the Word of God. So then the Father is the sower. And the sower sowing the seed is the Father sending his Son to live among us. And what is the purpose of this sowing? Well, the purpose of planting any seed is what? That you would reproduce the plant that you are planting. What is the purpose of the Father sending his Son, but that through him we might bring he might bring, as the Bible says, many sons to glory, that he might make us into children of God. To put it simply, God sends his son into the world so that his character might be reproduced in us. The purpose and meaning of our existence is that we would become like Christ, that through our love and good works, we would give the Father a return on his investment. He has planted the word in our hearts, and if we receive it properly, we will yield a harvest of good deeds. So the question then is, for us, what sort of soil are you? How do you respond to the presence of Christ that the Father has planted in your heart? The first category, number one, option number one, Jesus says, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. You see, this first category refers to those people who don't even understand. The obstacle here with those first people is ignorance. That's why they're pictured as a paved road. You see, there's a fly up here. Uh, you see, the paved road, the seed doesn't even begin to penetrate, right? 
So it just, it literally bounces off, right? So the word comes to those people and it doesn't even begin to sink in. The problem is ignorance. And we might think, oh, well, that doesn't apply to anyone here. Because certainly if you're already here in church, then that means that you have understood something. But that's not necessarily true. I mean, we all, we all know. Let's be honest. Just because you're in church, as I've heard it said before, just because you're in church doesn't make you a Christian, just like being in a garage doesn't make you a car. Doug, did I get that from you? Have I heard you say that before? Oh, that sounds like something, Doug, yeah, I, for some reason I connect that with him, but yeah, uh, that makes sense, right? Just because you're in church doesn't make you a Christian. Because there are many of us, perhaps, perhaps secretly, perhaps openly, we have rejected Christianity, rejected God, uh, perhaps uh, religion altogether appears to us as naive, childish. I'm sure we've all heard people like Richard Dawkins talk about faith as a delusion. You guys know Richard Dawkins, you know what I'm talking about. When asked why he doesn't believe in God, one of his common responses is he'll say that he doesn't believe in God for the same reason he doesn't believe in the flying spaghetti monster. What's his point in saying that? Well, because it's just some random thing, right? No one here believes in the flying spaghetti monster. Why not? Well, because why would you? What evidence is there, right? That's right, that's right. Okay, so that, that's where we're going. Thank you, thank you. So, this, this idea, right, that, what, what difference does it make, right? What evidence is there? That the Bible is a myth, Christianity is unscientific. These are the things that are there, and I'm sure there are people here, certainly, in a group this size, there are people here who feel this way, exactly. And I'll say for myself, I've been there. Uh, this describes how I have felt uh, in the past. But the reality is, is that this sort of attitude, and I say this without intending any insult, uh, but this sort of attitude represents ignorance. Uh, and again, I don't say that as, as a jab, it's just a simple fact that someone like Richard Dawkins or someone like Neil deGrasse Tyson, these are, I'm sure, excellent scientists, excellent people in their field. But they know as little about theology as I know about microbiology or astrophysics, right? We all have our expertise, and sometimes uh, people who speak outside of that expertise are knocking down a straw man, right? But here's the unfortunate thing, is that I think that those who are most responsible for the spread of atheism in the modern world are believers. Because the kind of straw man that someone like Richard Dawkins is knocking down is not something that he just made up. This is the kind of simplistic, overly uh, reductive, unsophisticated faith that we have been guilty of propagating. Let me tell you what I mean. If we treat God, and if we talk about God as a kind of magic wizard that lives in the sky, who grants us wishes, well, then who is to blame but us when society realizes that there is no giant wizard living in the sky that grants wishes, right? You see the problem? There is no genie uh, that will magically do what we want. And when we set people up with these false expectations, when they then enter any sort of trial or tribulation, that simple childlike faith collapses because it has not been refined with any sort of nuance or any sort of maturation. The Apostle Paul says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. And those believers with a shallow and immature faith, 
that is not ready for trials and tribulations is what Jesus describes as the second category. So now we move to part two. Jesus says, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet, such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. You see, they immediately receive the word with joy, but they immediately fall away because they have no root. They're not like those on the pavement who could not sprout at all, but those who fall on rocky ground have shallow roots that wither in the sun. And I fear that many, many of us fall under this category. We are happy to say that we believe in God now. We're happy to go to church now. We're happy to pray and read our Bibles now, but we are not prepared for suffering to come. We're not prepared for trials and tribulations. So when, the, when those things do come, our faith will shrivel up and die. And what good is that? A faith that only works when things go well is no faith at all. Jesus compares this in another place to the house that is built on sand, that as soon as the wind and rain comes, it collapses. Well, the whole point of a house is to protect you from wind and rain. So if your house doesn't hold up in a storm, then it's no house at all. And the same is true of our faith. That if we don't have a faith that can endure suffering, if we don't have a faith that can prepare us for the worst things in life, then what sort of faith is that? For the majority of us, we don't wrestle enough with faith. We don't dig deep enough so that then when tragedy does strike, we begin asking questions. Where was God? How could God allow this to happen? Why should this happen to me? But you see, if you wait till that moment, if you wait until you feel that sense of urgency of suddenly, oh, now I need God, but your faith has not matured, it will often be too late. Because when you're right there in the middle of suffering, when you're right there in the middle of tragedy, you're too overcome with grief, too overcome with suffering to see clearly. And so those questions will become more desperate. Now is the time when things are going well to prepare for the worst of things. I get genuinely worried for people whose faith is too convenient we have to remember that to be a Christian is to be marked for death with the sign of the cross. Right at the heart of Christian faith and spirituality is suffering and death. A Christian of all people, of all people in the world, a Christian should never be caught off guard by suffering and tragedy. Just read the scriptures. Time and time again, we are told to rejoice in our sufferings because when we suffer, we are being made like Christ. But if our faith is not mature, then when the fires of tribulation come, rather than purifying us, the fires of tribulation will simply burn us up. Now think about this. There's something really ingenious about Jesus' description here of the plant on rocky ground. Because he uses the sun to represent trials and tribulations. Now why is that so clever? Because for a plant that has solid roots, a sun, the sun, is what brings nourishment and life to the plant. It's only a plant that has shallow roots, the sun, rather than nourishing it, destroys it. So what's the lesson to be learned here? But that we should not be asking God that we might avoid suffering. We should not ask to avoid suffering, but we should ask that we might be prepared so that when suffering comes, we are nourished by it rather than destroyed by it.
As the letter of James reads, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. Now the third type, on the other hand, does not lose faith because of hardship, but because of ease. This is category number three now. Jesus says, This is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. You'll notice that when Christ teaches his disciples how to pray, he says, Give us this day our daily bread. And this language is so specific, we have to pay attention to this. Because like the Israelites in the wilderness collecting manna, we are instructed to ask only for our daily bread. In other words, we are not only asking God for what we need, but we are also asking God to not give us more than we need. After all, what happened to the manna that was collected? If you tried to create a reserve for yourself, if you tried to save some for tomorrow, what happens? But that it rots, becomes filled with worms. And you see the spiritual lesson there, is that we are instructed time and time again, from the beginning of Scripture to the end, to avoid this sense of accumulation. We should be, I know this is so surprising to us, and this is, this is hard for us to really get our minds around, but we should be more concerned about having too much than we are about being concerned about having too little, right? There is a greater danger in having too many possessions than in having not enough. Think about it. Jesus tells the crowds, blessed are you who are poor. Blessed are you who hunger now. Blessed are you who mourn. Blessed are you when people hate you, exclude you, revile you, and defame you. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, Jesus says. But not only does Jesus offer a blessing, not only does Jesus say, happy are you when you suffer, but he says to be wary of our successes. He says, woe to you who are rich. Woe to you who are well fed. Woe to you who laugh now. Woe to you when all people speak well of you. We should rejoice in our poverty and in our hunger because through these trials, God is producing in us a Christ-like character. Through our difficulties, we are being conformed to the image of God's Son. We're learning patient endurance. We're learning to put our trust in God and not in the false confidence of riches. Now this is why Jesus says things like, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. He says, where a, treasure, where a person's treasure is, there his heart will be also. And Jesus identifies wealth as the ultimate competition for our loyalty to God. So when Jesus says, no one can serve two masters, no one can serve God and mammon, God and wealth, God and money. And I know that what Christ teaches about wealth can be difficult, can be confusing, surprising, but I'll just say this, that the more uncomfortable we are with this kind of language, with these sayings of Jesus, the more uncomfortable we are with this, the more careful we should be. You see, because if you feel a twinge of conscience when you hear things like this, if it makes you sort of uncomfortable, the more likely it is that you're falling into this third category where the cares of the world and the lures of wealth are choking off the word of God in our hearts. Now, we're a good Adventist crowd, so I think that this analogy will make sense. Imagine if we thought about money the way we talk about alcohol. Sure, a little bit can bring pleasure, 
No one denies that. But have too much, and it can kill you, right? So then what sense would it make if someone were to come to you and say, I want to figure out how much alcohol I can possibly consume before it does real damage to me, right? But that's the kind of attitude that we have when it comes to wealth. We say, okay, well, we, I know that if I have too much that it would be a bad thing, but let me figure out what's that limit, right? What's the most that I can have and still be on the safe side? But if, and, and, and I'm struggling with this as much as you are, but if this is what Scripture says, if this is what Jesus is warning us about, that the cares and concerns of this life, that our attachment to our possessions, that our desire to accumulate, if that is such a spiritual danger, then maybe we shouldn't have this attitude of, well, how much can I get before it becomes a danger? Because remember that the whole purpose of the Father sowing the Word of God, the whole point of God sending His Son, is to reproduce His character in us. That's our one and only goal in life, to be Christ-like. Therefore, we want to be that good soil, that fourth category. This is the one who hears the Word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case, a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. The fruit we are expected to yield is what? The fruits of good works, works of mercy, works of justice, works of love. The Bible says, He has shown you, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you, to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And how is it? How is it that this change can take place in us? How is it that the character of Christ can be reproduced in us so that the works of Christ might be accomplished in us? How is that possible? First, we must understand our faith in a mature way. Second, we must be prepared to accept suffering as a means of our sanctification. And therefore, we must not allow the concerns of the world and the lure of wealth to choke out our spiritual life. Now, to put it all very simply, in order for us to yield a harvest to God, we must be prepared to die with Christ. You see, Paul also uses this analogy of Jesus coming to earth as the Father sending a seed. In 1 Corinthians 15, he writes, now pay attention to this carefully. Paul says, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a physical body, it is raised a spiritual body. If we are to share in Christ's life, we must also share in his death. As the Apostle Peter writes, Rejoice insofar as you are sharing Christ's suffering, so that you may also be glad and shout for joy when his glory is revealed. When life is difficult, when tragedy strikes, rejoice, because God is making you like himself. So all of us, all of us, even now, even now while life is going well, while things may be easy, every day we have to take up our cross to follow Jesus, to present ourselves to God as living sacrifices. This is a faith that is mature. This is a faith that will hold up under trial. This is a faith that will bring us love and joy and peace. This is a faith that will bring honor and glory to God our Father. Let's pray. Father God, it's a challenge to hear your word. We need your spirit to soften our hearts, to make us receptive to your truth. God, do not take your Holy Spirit from us when we are uncomfortable, when we are convicted. Continue to pursue us. 
We give ourselves to you. We hand over our lives to you. We present ourselves as living sacrifices. And we pray that this sacrifice of ours may be acceptable to you. And we ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.